Hi, this is Mark Weitzman. I want to do a um, resume my um, blogs. I know it's not a weekly blog anymore. I'll still call it a weekly blog, but I'll be lucky if I do once a month. And um, so, welcome to my channel, Theoretical Physics with Mark Weitzman. And I just want to talk about some things that I've been doing this past week. Um, when you're retired like I am and you, ha and you can do a lot of physics, sometimes you concentrate on one subject, like lately I've been concentrating on group theory, and sometimes you just go all over the place. You just spend like a week or two and you read some papers or, you know, respond to some comments on MOOCs and you run into one thing after another. So I just want to show, like... Um, how various things I find or what I found lately that you might have some interest in. So I'd like to start with, um, I was just on um, YouTube looking for some videos to watch and I saw all of a sudden that MIT had updated their quantum field theory course the first semester. It's, this is the um, 2023 graduate version. And I know that people all the time are asking me about a good quantum field theory MOOC. Well, this is on uh, MIT OCW site, but the great thing about it is, is that it's a beginning quantum field theory course. Basically, it covers um, QED and some renormalization and some basics of quantum field theory. It's the first semester of a three-semester course. And, uh, you know, it has lecture videos, there are about, let me see, 26 lecture videos. I know it doesn't show them all on there, but there are. And, um, you know, they have a whole description of the course, what topics they'll cover, the readings. The main textbook they use is uh, Peskin and Schroeder, so they do cover a little bit of Weinberg Chapter 1 on the history, but mostly it's Peskin and Schroeder. And... Um, they have their own sort of like recitation and notes, and um, they're they're reasonably good. Um, I've only watched the first video, and I've only looked at the first um, set of notes. Um, hold on a second. I'll try and uh, get, well, yeah, this will, um, I don't know, this will probably just download it. See if I can, okay, there it is. Um, this is like the first recitation notes, and um, you know they're they're of reasonable detail, but they're not. Um, well, well, I don't know. It might be sufficient. You're still probably going to need the textbooks, and um, and they have the problem sets with all the solutions. So um, there are about ten problem sets. And they have the actual assignment. And then, um, go back here for a second. And then the next, the answers, the answers are there. Students are always complaining they want answers. So this might be, uh, if you're looking for a beginning quantum field theory course, um, this might be as close to a MOOC as you can get online right now. Um, so that's one thing that I discovered this week, just, I, I don't know, I get these emails from MIT OCW all the time, and they usually mention new courses that they have, but they didn't mention this. Maybe they'll mention it next time, but I found it anyway. Now, a lot of things I find, like, I follow a blog, this is uh, the Not Even Wrong blog by White, and he started mentioning this thing about this paper um, by this, um, I'm not gonna, this physicist who passed away a couple of years ago, an Indian physicist, I'm not gonna pot him, I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce his full name, but, um, so I looked at this paper, and it's not that hard a paper, but it's, it's a very interesting paper on the difficulty of getting non-relativistic quantum mechanics from quantum field theory, you know, so um, as I was reading this paper and everything, I noticed that he cites, you know, he has a footnote to at the very end. This first thing he cites is um, Sleeping Beauties in Theoretical Physics. 
So I have this book. It's one of the books that's on my to-read list. I read about half of it. Excellent book. I highly recommend it. It's got like uh, 26 chapters on like... There's another set of books a long time ago called Surprises in Theoretical Physics. This is sort of like that except more detailed. It's at the advanced undergraduate level. And um, he's got like uh, 26 things where he covers things... Um, that um, you wouldn't uh, necessarily know. And it, it's kind of like very interesting. It's very, each one of these things are like, is a surprise or is something that you didn't know in theoretical physics. So I highly recommend this book. And um, I was looking at chapter 15, the one body problem that corresponds to what he talked about in the paper. And I remember reading it, but not reading the whole thing. So I decided to go back and finish this whole book. That will take me about two months, maybe. I'll do like a chapter every other day. But that's now on uh, another book I can add to my reading list and another thing I found. And uh, I do recommend uh, looking at this paper um, if you're interested in this material. It's it's not a difficult paper to understand at parts. Parts of it, it's like it, he skims a little bit, but... Um, and then in the book, he, he has less detail and, and on, at a lower level. So um, the next thing I found was I was on um, a MOOC course. Oops. Oh. Trying to... Uh, can't do it. I don't know why. Okay, this is a course now being given by Jim Freewicks of Georgetown University on mathematical and computational methods. It's like sophomore level, but somebody posted in the thing about, um, posted a question on um, regularization. He wanted like an outside source. And so I did um, a tiny search and I found this paper and um, it's an interesting paper. It's, the first four parts are very easy at freshman level, maybe sophomore level, but you can sort of see how regularization applies to um, statics, uh, statics and electromagnetism, for like um, the potential and electric field from a line charge. So I recommend if you want to know a little bit about regularization and, you know, to read the first four parts of this paper. And then the other parts are not difficult either, and they have to do with um, the process of dimensional regularization in quantum field theory in the context of a much simpler example. And um, so this is a short, easy-to-understand paper. So I found that. Now the, uh, the next thing that I was doing in my um, group theory, I was reading this book by Tung, in group theory, and there was a part of it, you see I wrote some notes and now I crossed it out. One thing you have to accept, I've had students complain to me sometimes, they said, oh, I don't like this book, it has errors in it. There isn't a physics book written that doesn't have errors. If you go to the original Feynman lectures in physics, they've got pages and pages of errata on the uh, corrections that were made on the Feynman lectures on physics. And it's just, you know, that's just the way they are. I'll, I'll give you an example Here's like Peskin and Schroeder. This was updated. This was corrected. And then, you know, since then, look at all these updates and corrections. And then like Mark Schenecke's quantum field theory book, same thing. Look at all these like errata. You know, it's just it's just a normal thing in a in a textbook. Lots of every textbook. I remember Steven Weinberg's um, quantum mechanics book, the first edition when it first came out, had a huge number of errors, especially for Weinberg. He usually doesn't have many errors in his book. But I found like 60 errors, and I sent him an email, and he replied. He said, um, thank you so much for this. Um, he said, I was familiar with the 30 of the errors, but I, the other 30 were new. And very shortly after that, he published a new edition. And then when I looked at the new edition, I only found like 10 errors. But it's just, you know, there are always errors. Some, <coughs> <coughs> some, 
Some of them are obvious things you can find, but some of them are subtle. And um, in this another group theory book that I'm using on Shenanstead, you know, just to show you, she's got this is her errata page. This is from a long time ago. That's like four pages of uh, corrections and amplifications. So this is common. Anyway, I was going through Tung's book, and I don't want to go in. I'll talk about this in detail when I make a video on it. This is concerning bisymmetry. And I was convinced that some of these equations were wrong, especially when I went into the answer book, and I looked at these like the derivation here, which was a solution, and um, these equations, I don't, even, I don't even want to amplify it because, um, well, okay, there you can see it a little better. Um, it's, it's called bisymmetry, where basically you permute the indices and you get the same thing. And I was under a misconception here, and I was sure that I wrote in my remarks here, I was sure that this was wrong, that this was, B, this was actually D of QP, and it wasn't a representation. And then I started having doubts, and I said, well, I'm just going to do it by hand. And I started to do it by hand, and it's not hard to do, but I kept making some mistakes. And finally I said, you know what, I'm just going to program it. So I, um, I usually, I, I always told myself I'm never going to program in Maple or others sometimes program in Mathematica. These are great software things, but they're not good for programming. You're much better off just programming in Python. But I decided to do it in Maple, and um, this was my, I wrote a short program, and uh, it probably look, took longer for me to write this and get it to work than it did to... Um, do it by hand, but what I liked about it was I um, was able to use some new um, packages that I never use. Like they have a group theory package, and you can just take like you can set something equal to the symmetric group S three, and then you see as uh, the elements of S three, it has this is in like cycle notation, but it has the six permutations of S three. Then you can actually cycle over those permutations. So anyway, I computed all these representation matrices using exactly the formula, this thing on MR, C, this line over here. I used um, exactly this formula, same one in the book that I just showed you. And I was expecting, um, you know, when I did the representations to see if they worked out, I was expecting it wouldn't work out, but it did work out. They were all zeros, as they should be. And um, and these were inverses, as it should be. So I began to realize, hey, this formula is, um, is probably correct. And then I thought about it a long, long time, and I realized my mistake, and it was correct. So sometimes the book is right, but, you know, the reason why I was so sure that it was wrong was they had another error here a very obvious error on where it says uh, n times m dimensional in this line here. And uh, I knew this was wrong. I knew that he meant m to the n. And uh, so I figured if he made a mistake on that, he might have made a mistake down here, but he didn't. But anyway, it's always good to check these things. That's why you have to read books, verify all the equations. That's how you really learn advanced theoretical physics. Um, you got to do the problems, but you also got to read the textbook and verify all of the equations. It's hard to learn just from videos alone. And um, going back to the MIT course, he even says that um, the main thing is um, the problem sets. That's where you're really going to learn. And, and it's not just doing old stuff, a lot of times he does new stuff in the problem sets. In class, he just gives you a guide. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you for watching. Um, I know I'm behind on some of my new group theory videos. I'm going to try and catch up with them on this three-day weekend. Um, right now, I'm, um, I'm fixated on the uh, stock market and uh, various other things. A lot of volatility lately. And... Um, I have a lot of money to invest and I need to, um, I have a lot in cash right now and I need to put it to work in the market above what I have already. Anyway, um, 
Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.